Welcome. If you have been linked to this video by a friend or family member, one, you now know that they apparently think you're bad at completing long-term big projects because that's what this video is about. It's a series of tips on how to do that on time and to keep yourself on task. But two, you're also probably asking, who is this guy to tell me how to do that? Uh, get off my screen, young man. Eat, eat my ass. There you go. There's a project for you. Give me a second to explain. Um, I'm a best-selling author. I've now published five novels that have all sold well, have all been received well. And more importantly, all of them were written specifically exactly on deadline so that actually every stage of the writing from the research to the outline to the editing, all of it was done on deadline. I have never missed a deadline in my life. These books are between 110,000 and 150,000 words long. They all took at least two years to write. And again, I was doing this all on the side, and yet I was able to keep myself on task and do it over and over again. I've been doing it for a long time now. And so I pretty much have this one thing down, how to complete a project that takes multiple years. If I offer you advice on anything else, uh, from making friends to managing money to not smelling weird, Anything else, feel free to ignore me. On the subject of completing a big project that takes a long time on schedule, keeping yourself on schedule, this is the one thing that you can take my advice on and you can actually go verify that I, in fact, am who I say I am and that these books exist and they've been received well and that they are apparently of good quality. I'm going to jump right into the list because I know your time is valuable. First, before you embark on a big project, Think about what you have to drop from your life. What in your life has to die? Because you have no doubt, just within the last few months, have someone come to you and say, I'm going to learn to code, or I'm going to learn a foreign language, or I'm going to learn the guitar, or I'm going to renovate a house, something that's a years-long project that they're going to embark on. What you probably have never heard someone say is, hey, I'm going to learn how to play guitar instead of spending time with my child, or I'm going to train for a marathon, um, but I'm going to do that instead of reading. I'm going to sacrifice some of my intellectual stimulation I get from reading so that I can train instead. No one thinks of the project they're taking on as a trade-off, but it always is. Because even if you come back and tell me, well, I actually, you know, there's a lot of my time and I'm not actually doing anything, that's factually not true. You are doing something 24 hours a day, even if that something is sleeping or just scrolling on your phone through Instagram. You are doing something and something, if you're taking on a big project that's going to occupy a lot of time every week, something is going to have to go. For example, many times when people say they, they're going to get fit, like I'm going to start working out, like a New Year's resolution, let's say. And they're like, this time next year, I'm going to be in much better shape. I'm going to lose X amount of weight or whatever. What they usually say is, I'm going to get up early in the morning and do this before work. Seems like an easy way to fit it into the schedule, especially for people that have kids, that sort of thing. But they rarely stop and say, well, okay, if I'm getting up like two hours earlier, then I've got to go to bed two hours earlier. I'm going to bed at like 9 p.m. every night now. You have to stop and ask yourself, well, what were you doing before from 9 p.m. until bedtime? And if you say, well, nothing, I was just, you know, we were, I would uh, stay up and watch TV with my husband or, or my girlfriend or whoever. Okay, have you discussed this with your husband or wife or girlfriend? Because you may find out that that time spent from 9 o'clock until bedtime watching TV with you was the highlight of their day they may have seen that as really valuable. So this thing that you're willing to give up in order to work out in the morning, make sure they're okay with it. Because the way this sneaks up on you is that a lot of people when they embark on a project like this, it's not the work or the practice or whatever itself that derails them. It's that it seems like the people around them are not supporting them. And it's like, well, you know, I tried to start a band, but my wife didn't support me. Or, or I tried to become an artist, but, you know, my, my girlfriend or my friends put a lot of pressure on me to stop. The reason they did that is because you never went to them and said, hey, I'm taking on a weekend project. I'm going to, like, I bought an old house, so we're going to fix it up and, and flip it and get rich. But 
weekend project means you need to stop and ask yourself, what are you doing with your weekends now? And if you say, well, I'm just going out with my friends and, and drinking every Saturday night, okay, are you willing to lose that? Because if you're not, then know that in advance. Are your friends willing to lose that? Your social circle is important to you. So this step that almost everyone skips winds up sneaking up on them later because they find out, you know, two, three, four months down the line, there's these things in their life that are suffering. Like, you know, my, my relationship with my child, if you've got a child or, or your relationship with your, your girlfriend or boyfriend. And that's why it's because you didn't think in advance of what you're doing was going to cost you in terms of your schedule or them in terms of theirs or in terms of their emotional health because everything you're doing right now even the things that seem kind of meaningless are serving some purpose so this first tip is just about recognizing specifically what thing you're going to make go away and being actively knowledgeable about it in advance because right now most people just discuss a project like this as if it's just a pure addition to your life but you cannot manufacture additional hours and minutes to your life. You can only stop doing one thing and start doing another. So before you start, look at your schedule and really be frank with yourself about what you're dropping and then think about the people who it affects and make sure they understand it too. Rule number two, think about why you're doing the thing and act accordingly. If the project you're taking on is just, say, for relaxation, say you've decided you want to start gardening, you're going to develop a garden and by this time next year you're going to grow a crop of tomatoes or, or whatever. If you're just doing it to chill out, um, if you're trying to, you know, to get away from wasting so much time in your phone and so you're going to learn to play an instrument just because you've heard that playing a musical instrument is a good stress relief, fine. Do it. If you do it and it's not relieving your stress, drop it. But if you're taking on the project because you have to do it, and by that I mean if you're getting fit because your doctor told you you have to get fit or you're going to die, or if you're taking on a project because you want to change careers because you're miserable in the job you're in now, like if you're learning to code like so many people are these days because computers are the future or whatever, if you're learning a foreign language because you want to get a sales job in another country, you want to leave America, maybe you think America is doomed and you hate it. If you've decided that your future life and well-being depends on this project, then you need to treat it like a job. If you want to do like me and write books and do it professionally, like your goal is with an X number of years to be able to support yourself writing books, you have to treat it like a job. And that is a world of difference. Because that means if you've bought some software to teach yourself uh, Japanese or whatever, and you say, okay, every Friday night, I'm going to sit down and devote Friday nights to learning Japanese. If your friends come to you and say, hey, it's, it's uh, Fat Joey's uh, birthday party, we're going out to the bar drinking, you need to treat that exactly like you were on the way to the office in your work clothes about to board the bus and they came pulling up in their car and said, hey, knock off work and let's go drinking with Fat Joey. You probably would not do that because the risk of losing your job, the risk of getting caught, getting in trouble at work is too great. So even though you're missing that guy's birthday party, you would do it because that's your job. It comes before everything else because it has to, because you will die starving in the streets without a job. If what you're doing is with an eye toward it becoming your career five years from now, the only way you will be successful is if you have the mindset, this is my job. If I'm going to learn Japanese Friday night starting at six o'clock, I am punching a time clock and nothing pulls me away from it. You know, whether you're not feeling well, any circumstances under which you would go to the, to the office, you need to not miss the thing you're practicing, even if it's you're starting a band because you want to eventually be a professional musician. It doesn't matter what it is. If you've decided it's something you need to do because it's a change in your life you need to make, then you need to treat it as such. Many, many people try to split the difference in the worst possible way on this. I know many people who have a full-time job, full-time career, and they have this vague sense of, well, one day I would like to write like you. A lot of people will say that to me. 
But when you ask them what they're writing, it's like, well, you know, I've got a couple of ideas and, you know, I, I, I try to, you know, I get time, I try to dabble in it. If you really want that, if you are miserable enough in your current job where it's like my future life and well-being depends on finding something else or something like this, something that's more satisfying, then you need to set aside time and be willing to say no to everyone during the windows of time you've set aside to do this thing. Because if you say, well, I'll only do it in my true spare time when none of my friends or family or other hobbies or just moods are pulling me in a different direction, you will never get it done. I'm telling you that from life experience. If you don't make it serious for yourself where it is do or die, you will never get it done. And again, if you're just doing it for fun, that's fine. You should have hobbies you're just doing for fun. Not everything has to be a job. But if you sense that you're in a dead end professionally or in terms of lifestyle, in terms of whatever, and that this project you're taking on is trying to turn around your financial situation or your own well-being or your mental health or your physical fitness, then you have to treat it the same way you would treat a job and the same way that you, the same mortal fear most of us have of getting fired if we screw up at work or if we don't show up. That's how you have to feel about missing your band practice. Even though it may seem, you know, like frivolous, anything that's like an artistic pursuit may seem, you know, by necessity to be a less serious thing. If your goal is to do it professionally, you need to be a professional. Three, Focus on the step that's right in front of you. This is where I differ from most other self-help gurus. Yes, I just referred to myself as a self-help guru. That, I guess, is my new career. Um, many people, when they say, and you're starting like a physical fitness regimen, to get like a photo of the body you want, like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in this prime, and put it on your wall, and you look at that every day as for motivation. Or, or if you're fixing up a house, I, another project I did, I renovated a house over the course of five years, also while working full-time, also while having another part-time job in the side. And they will say, take the photo of like the finished project or the finished kitchen that you want, you know, out of the magazine where you found it and you got the idea for the design and put that on the wall. And that's what you, that's what motivates you every day to go in and do the work. That to me has the opposite effect. Because for me, if you work out for three months, and you realize that not only do you still not look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but you don't look measurably different from how you looked when you started, that kills my motivation. And keeping your motivation up long term over the course of a couple years is everything. It's kind of all that matters. I have been much, much, much more successful by saying, I don't have an entire house to renovate or I don't have an entire novel to write. That's too overwhelming for me, and I think most people, because you're talking about a process that may have literally a thousand individual steps that you have to do. So for me, I only say, I don't have a whole house to renovate. This weekend, we have to paint those cabinets. That's it. That's the one thing I have to do is paint those cabinets, and that is doable. That can be done. Or in terms of writing my books, this weekend, I've got to fix this chapter. I know what's wrong with it. By the end of this weekend, I will have fixed it. That's it. I'm not thinking about the 100,000 more words I've got to write past that. I'm not thinking about anything. I've got a list um, that I'm constantly revising of what has to be done next, and I'm holding to it, and I'm only looking at the next thing. Now, at some point in the past, I have sat down and figured out if I've got one year to get this thing done or two years to get this thing done, I figured out, well, that means I've got to have this done by October, this done by Christmas, and so on. And so that list is how I know what the one thing is. But once I have the list in place, I only think about the one thing, and that keeps me from getting um, burnt out because you can sense the progress. Even though your house still doesn't look like the ideal version, or even though your body still doesn't look like Schwarzenegger, if the goal you have set is, okay, I can only do 15 curls with the whatever the 50 pound barbells but by this time next month i want to be able to do 25 now you've got a measurable thing now you can say all right i've done it or i can do 23 i'm getting close you can there the progress is more measurable because instead of measuring yourself against this incredibly unrealistic far off end result you're only thinking in terms of lifting this many weights and getting to getting stronger by then 
and you can be encouraged because it's like, hey, a month ago, I could only do 12 of these. Now I can do 25. That's twice as many. It doesn't matter that I don't look like Schwarzenegger. It's clear that I am progressing. That's all the difference in the world. For me, that's the only way that ever works. Four, setbacks are progress. Setbacks are part of the process. No matter what you're doing, like let's say you're writing a book like me, at some point in that process, you will have to go back and delete entire chapters that you spent months writing and conceptualizing because you realize they just don't work. If you are fixing up a house, I can say this from experience, there will be some point where you have spent dozens of hours getting tile up on a wall in your kitchen only to find out there is a water line running behind that wall and the plumber comes and says, you have to rip out that tile because that's the only way to access that water line that we have to move. You will rip out that tile and you will get discouraged and you will want to quit because you will say all of that work was wasted. Or if you're training to run your marathon, you twist your ankle at some point, you have six weeks when you can't train, you'll gain 10 pounds and feel like all of your fitness progress has been lost. Every long-term project I've ever done has had that kind of setback of some kind. If you're learning a technique, you may find out you've been doing it wrong and you have to completely reteach yourself. Whatever. Every, every version of this has some, something that will derail you. The setbacks are progress because you had to go through that to learn it for next time. Every athlete in the world has to know how to recover from injury. They're constantly getting hurt. That's a part of it you know, losing some of your fitness, losing some of your lung capacity and having to get it back, that's going to be a part of your future. Writing and rewriting, deleting the stuff that you wrote, that is a key part of writing. It's a key part of editing. There's no such thing as writing that doesn't have that. So you have to be able to put yourself in the mindset the first time you hit one of those speed bumps and have to go backward, progress is not just this slope that goes up. You go up and you go back down, you go up, you go back down, you go back and a series of those little setbacks, but they are built into the, prog the process. And everyone that knows how to do this very well, and when you watch them work, they never seem to have some of these same problems. It's only because they made those same mistakes when they were younger, and they've done it so many times that they saw the mistake coming in advance. And before they wrote that chapter, they started to see what the problems were going to be. Or before they went to work on that kitchen wall, they said, ah, you know what, we better check and make sure there's no water lines back here. The only way to learn that stuff is generally by experiencing. No matter how good your teacher is, you kind of just have to run into it. Know in advance. That way you will not get discouraged because, again, your motivation is everything. And that's what happens. Is you get that setback and you lose your motivation. If you're on a diet and you lose a bunch of weight and then suddenly you, you, you kind of quit during the holidays and you gain 10 pounds back, that's where everybody drops their diet. It's because... Seeing the scale go the wrong direction just kills their motivation. That is natural. There's no such thing as a weight loss program that doesn't have some gains built into it where people ask anyone who's ever lost weight. That's part of the process. Before we go on to the next point, I am going to very briefly interrupt the video with an ad for my own book I have coming out. Here we go. Imagine a future where superpowers are possible, but everyone's just too dumb to use them. Welcome to my world. Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick by David Wong is a new novel that Publishers Weekly calls a brilliant modern parable disguised as pop fiction. Order it at futuristicviolence.com. Number five, anticipate interruptions in your schedule. A lot of people, when they sit down to budget their time, they say, okay, let's look at what a normal week is. And in a normal week, I do this on Saturday, this on Friday, this on Sunday, whatever. That means that I can do every Thursday, I can do this. And then, you know, I'll do that once a week and then so on. They, they plan it out that way. There's a really simple fallacy built into that, which is the phrase normal week. No life really has that many normal weeks. When you try to say, well, here, what's a typical week for you look like? In reality, you're only describing about 60% of your weeks. And you'll hear this when you talk to people and they're like, well, you know, I had a stretch um, where I couldn't uh, run because things got really busy at work. So I was working a bunch of overtime, so I couldn't run. It's like, okay, but 
that's going to happen. Uh, I mentioned just moments ago that someone whose diet got interrupted by the holidays. Well, think about how many holidays there are. It's like, well, I was on a diet, but then Valentine's Day came, and then the 4th of July came, and then uh, Halloween, I've ate a bunch of Halloween candy, and then Thanksgiving came, and then my birthday came, and then Christmas came, and then New Year's came. And you suddenly realize, oh, there's like 37 of these interruptions in a normal, in a normal year, because uh, maybe you went on vacation during the summer, and while you're on vacation, you kind of ate irresponsibly, or whatever. Same thing, if you say, well, I've got, it's a weekend project, so my Saturday is going to be devoted to fixing up the house. How many Saturdays do you actually have? It's not 52 because some of those are going to land on holidays, are going to land on birthdays, are going to land on weeks when you've had to travel, maybe for work. They're going to land on weeks when you got sick or when you've hurt yourself or when you ran out of money. It happens a lot, especially when you're talking about something like fixing up a house or talking about paying for language lessons or maybe a personal trainer, anything like that. Um, those interruptions will 100% happen. And when you talk about what your typical schedule looks like, your typical schedule is that every few weeks there's going to be an interruption. That when you say, I'm going to devote my Saturdays to doing this, that you're really only talking about like, I don't know, 30 Saturdays a year if you're lucky. What does that mean? What does it mean for your schedule? What does it mean for, you know, do you have a plan for how you can make up that time? Or do you just account for it and say, okay, it's going to take longer. It's going to take two years instead of one year to do this, you know, because their, their schedule in the software assumes I'll have every Saturday free, and that's just not realistic. The point is no going in, because in my experience, being able to recover from interruptions is kind of everything in terms of people who are able to stick with projects or not, because lots of people will be able to pursue language lessons or, you know, music lessons or whatever mentally taxing thing it is and get into a real groove in it and get really excited about it. But then the interruption comes and say their laptop dies and they've got three weeks where they can't do their coding lessons because till the laptop came back from the shop. During that three weeks, their motivation went away. They're not into it anymore. Being able to get yourself back into the groove after those interruptions and, you know, being able to anticipate them in advance is part of it. But that's a mindset thing where you're going to have to know going in that the initial rush and the initial excitement is eventually going to wear off. And it's going to wear off when one of these interruptions come and basically forces you to stop for a little bit. You have to be able to force yourself back into it somehow. Now, how you do that, I don't know because everyone's different. If it's a matter of creating some sort of a, a schedule for yourself that you track on like a whiteboard like I have on my wall here, or an app on your phone that is an alarm reminder, something to keep bringing it back into mind. It's like, hey, you know, it's been three Saturdays. You've got your laptop back now. Why are you not back on your lessons? You need, or it's a support system. You may be at your spouse or a partner or a friend that will nag you, somebody that will say, hey, you got to get back on the saddle here. The, the fact that that Christmas came or the fact that you took two weeks, you know, away for summer vacation, uh, that's not a reason to stop because you, you're doing this for the rest of your life. You did it because you wanted to learn how to play guitar because that was important to you. The fact that you kind of got out of your groove is not an excuse to stop. So I'm telling you right now, that problem is coming. How you solve it is going to wind up being up to you, but that will happen. Six. Everyone moves at a different pace and you cannot compare your progress to anyone else's. People learn at different speeds. People create at different speeds. People, their fitness occurs at different speeds. They build muscle mass faster. People have different support networks. Creative people operate at vastly different speeds. Stephen King says he can write an entire novel in three months. I cannot. You cannot adhere to anyone else's schedule. You have to find out what your schedule is, and that may take some time. What is important is that you stick with it and you continue to regularly do it. But you cannot get discouraged if four months in, if you say you've got a friend who's a workout partner and they just look measurably better than you already and you're not showing the same results, that's genetic. That's not, life is not fair. There are other things that you would maybe be able to do faster than other people. 
Likewise, if you're moving much faster than the program you've got, like if you're using a piece of software to learn a language and you actually find yourself moving faster than the software expects, it doesn't mean you're a prodigy or that this is easy for you. It just means that that part of your brain moves a little bit faster and that's fine. Adjust your schedule accordingly. The key again is that you not get discouraged by the fact that you're not getting your thing done as fast. What matters is that you're staying on the task and that you not quit and not have these large gaps in between coming back to it. That can't be the reason you fall behind. If you're giving it steady effort and just not showing the same results, everyone has different results. No two people will be the same. Know that in advance. Seven, get help. Seek out help, be willing to accept it. No matter what project you're doing, the odds are there is someone on earth, or probably a lot of people, probably an entire subculture of people who have done it before. They know all of the pitfalls. They know all of the things that can derail you because they've all been through it. And in many cases, they will be thrilled to talk to you. Some of them will not, especially on the internet. Some people will be dicks about it and they will be gatekeeping and kind of make fun of you because you don't know what you're doing. But other people, you look long enough, they will be thrilled to talk to you and help you along and give you advice and give you resources and tell you where to look. If you can find someone like that, pick their brain, ask them questions, watch them work, absorb all the tips that you can. There's a sub point to this. It's extremely important because you may even see in the comments of videos like this, or maybe even this very video, where people have a knee jerk rejection of advice like this because automatically when someone is trying to teach you something, there's a presumption that they are superior. Like I'm obviously smarter than you because I'm telling you how to do the thing and you clearly, I know more than you. And if you're like me, you can have a kind of a, you can bristle at that because it's kind of a bruise to your own ego. And you'll even see like a common comment I'll see, like let's say there's a video with tips on how to save money. And one of the tips is, you know, don't eat out at restaurants, cook at home. And you'll immediately see a comment, it's like, well, I can't afford to eat out of restaurants anyway. You know, it's I can barely afford canned food. This is a terrible tip, but this doesn't help me. It's like, well, yeah, but it helps somebody else. <laughs> Take the information, take what's helpful. If of the seven things on this list, if three of them help you, then discard the other four. The point is, if you're in a mindset where you're annoyed by people, like the perception that they're talking down to you or, they're, or that they're not in a position to be helping you or, or it's like, well, who is this guy to tell me how to live my life? Try to get over that. Because improving, if you're really serious about it, does mean killing your ego a little bit and letting yourself be built up and opening yourself up to hearing tips, no matter who it's from, even if it's from somebody uh, you, you hate. One final word. A lot of the points on this list have come back to motivation, about not letting your motivation lag, not letting things derail your motivation. At the end of the day, if you say, I followed all of these tips, and I still, the issue is that when I come home from work, when that's the time that I should be lifting weights, I still just, I sit on the sofa and look at my phone and I've, um, I'm unable to motivate myself to get out and do it. I, how do I motivate myself? You've got to understand, not only can I not help you with that, but no one can help you with that. You ultimately have to find a way to make yourself, once you've got the schedule down, once you've figured it out, once you've got the knowledge about how to do it, only you can make yourself get off the sofa and go do the thing instead of playing a video game or doing whatever you would otherwise do. If you can't make yourself do that, then that's the end of the discussion because here's the thing, all of society is just a series of systems to motivate people to do things. All of the laws, all of the religions, all of the cultures, Everything that you're advertising, everything you see around you is just about trying to motivate human beings to do this thing and not do this other thing. The people you see around you who are very good at things, oftentimes their motivation is terrible. It's, you know, a lot of people get fit out of pure vanity. A lot of people learn how to trade stocks out of greed. Do you see what I'm saying? They have found something inside themselves that sometimes is insecurity, sometimes is bitterness. 
Like I'm going to go out there and I'm going to learn to do this to, to really show it to my, to my old man or to show up the bullies in high school. Like I'm going to go out and succeed at this to show those people who were mean to me in gym class that I'm, I'm a big man. Sometimes the motivations are crazy. Sometimes they're, you know, they're supernatural in nature or they're religious or, or they're doing it because someone else has forced them to do it. No two people are motivating themselves the same way, but successful people have found somehow to do it because it takes a lot of motivation to get yourself out of bed every morning at 5 a.m. and go jogging in the cold rain. It takes a lot of motivation to sit down and write 150,000 words of a book because that's not all fun and games and imagination. A lot of it, it is, you know, homework and grinding through and correcting phrasing and doing all sorts of tedious stuff that gets you to the finish line. You will have to experiment with different ways to do that, and only you can do it. It's a Motivation is a sort of mind game you play in yourself, and you have to trick yourself into doing the thing that you don't want to do in the moment that you know long-term needs to be done. If you can do that, everything else should be manageable. I hope this helped. I'm going to leave you with an ad for the newest book I have coming out. I am a fiction author. I am not a self-help author, if you couldn't tell. Uh, the new book is called Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick. The tone of the book is pretty much conveyed by the title. Otherwise, this video will tell you what it's about. Thank you. You know how sometimes you wake up naked and hung over on a friend's trampoline with only fuzzy memories of how you got there? Well, imagine all of civilization did that at once. Friday, a local man equipped with an implanted groin enhancement lit up the dance floor, but probably not the way he intended. That's the future, the aftermath of bad decisions everyone regrets but would definitely make again. Now imagine it's the future and you're me, living in a trailer with your cat and your mom, bothering nobody. Then one day you find out you've inherited a billion dollars from a scumbag biological father you barely knew. The bad news is you find out he made that money by committing many, many crimes. In fact, most of the things he did that weren't crimes were only legal because no one had thought to make them crimes yet. Like selling black market technology that supposedly gives people superpowers. Lookers watched in horror as a man calling himself Lord Rocket collided in midair with a flock of geese. Police say the woman... So now you're in charge of your father's inner circle, a team of con artists who use creepy psychological warfare tricks to secretly run everything behind the scenes. You now have no choice but to work with them, all of you trying to keep a horde of superhuman morons from tearing the city apart. imagine that an author wrote all of these events into an award-winning book series. Only you don't have to imagine that part, because it actually happened. The first book was called Futuristic Violence and Fancy Suits. It drew glowing praise from the New York Times, and Publishers Weekly called it subtly brilliant, which is impressive for a book that contained 36 instances of the word but. And then imagine that for some reason, no one stopped David Wong from writing a second book in the series called Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick, which is available for pre-order now pretty much anywhere books are sold. David Wong, AKA Jason Pargin, is also the author of the best-selling John Dies at the End series. That one got turned into a movie. So ask your bookstore for Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick by David Wong, or go to futuristicviolence.com.